Well, then, all technologies really start as weapons, yeah. as, as toys, or as porn. AI is our latest slave. You know, the mm -hmm. notion of something that never gets tired, never complains, never goes to bed, never needs a vacation. When you learn how to prompt, stack prompts, pick right fit applications, and give it the right commands, and also know what it does, what it doesn't do well, you realize that you're not limited necessarily by time, money, capabilities, people, team size. You're really limited by your imagination and your ability to ask great questions. Dogs are a technology, so we say we've got yep. a 30,000 30, year track record of developing this technology. Let's just take the lessons with dogs and apply them to technology. just talking before we rolled cameras and you've got an interesting philosophy about dog sex ai and also stupid people smart people and technology so why don't you uh tell me the story about kids teenagers and sex yeah <clears throat> well one of the things i've noticed i noticed it a little bit when i was a teenager but then i'm you know right now i'm about uh 70 years beyond that uh and uh and what, but what I notice that happens with each new generation uh, of teenagers that they kind of discover that they're the first human generation that discovered sex, you know, and they said, they said, God, did you know about sex? I mean, it doesn't look like adults know about sex, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I noticed the same pattern with young people who suddenly uh get a hold of a new technology <clears throat> they think that they're the first humans who ever uh, uh who ever hit upon the whole notion that there are things that you can do with technology where with a little effort you get a much bigger result okay yep. and that they say you know it's just amazing that the world got as far as it got before we came along because we're the ones who discovered what technology is Okay, and it's kind of like sex. I mean, sex from a certain standpoint is sort of a technology for producing. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> it's misused, but uh, sometimes it actually produces good new human beings, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, <clears throat> and so, uh, but what I feel is what we call humanity are the animal species that discovered technology and that humans start with technology. And what I simply mean by that, that humans wanted to survive and they noticed to survive and actually get to the point where they could progress, they had to um, use resources from the environment around them, sticks and stones, and, uh, and uh, uh, to uh, get a better result that was greater than the amount of effort they had to put into it. Okay, and that's what technology is. And <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> I've been thinking about AI because <clears throat> it's the latest version in my lifetime <clears throat> of a new thing that people said, this changes everything. This changes everything. You know, just like teenagers feel sex changes everything. And, um, <clears throat> but I, I do believe that technology is just what humans do. Hmm. Oh, that's good. In all uh, places, in all places, in all times. And some are much better at it than others, and they tend to uh, be the winners and the ones who uh, is presented to them and they, they don't take advantage of it, and they're kind of the losers. And I think that, uh, Mike, you've been involved with it for, you know, uh, more than two thirds of your life now. And, uh, you know, more than that, maybe 80% yep. of your life, you've been directly involved in finding new things that give you a much bigger result than an effort, you know, and uh, you took to AI, but you've been doing the same thing. AI is just the latest thing that you took to. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> there is, one more framing thing that I want to cover that you shared this past week at Coach and before, and 
before I go into that, because yeah, I started doing tech. I mean, I started coding a little when I was maybe 11, 12, 13, and then 14 is really when I took the time I learned how to program. And uh, it wasn't too far off from there that I heard about Marvin Minsky, um, who is credited often for being one of the first people to really talk about software and AI. There have been concepts that go back way, way a long time ago. Um, and AI just needed a bunch of processing power to make it go and make it work. It's sort of like um, you couldn't have an iPhone until, you know, you had a battery that was small enough, a screen that was big enough, the internet. And, uh, you know, Steve Jobs thinking about doing a better MP3 player, which became the iPod. You know, there was an, there was an iPod before an iPod, just like there were a lot of computers before, you know, it's like, this is always an evolution. That's really what you're getting at is, and, and, you know, you think about what was one of the first, mach first technologies. Well, humans use other humans. Slaves were a pretty early technology. Hmm. That was probably, be there were, I'm sure that there were slaves before there were wheels. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, I tell a story when I teach AI, where I say, you know, it wasn't that long ago and you know, it's only been around 200,000 years that there have been modern humans. And, um, and I'm sure long before there were modern humans, you know, pre um, Homo sapiens were uh, knew how to use rocks and they used technology. And if there were a, was a bad tribe of people trying to steal your women and your children and your food in your cave, someone got really good at throwing rocks and teaching everyone else how to throw rocks well and kept those bad ones away until someone figured out how to put sharp, pointy rocks in the end of sticks and throw them or use a bow, right? So that was another form of technology until someone made gunpowder mm -hmm. and cannons and guns mm -hmm. and then knew how to mechanize the creation of guns and, you know, and on and on and on with the mechanization of war. That's pretty, pretty impressive technology. Yeah. And well, then, all technologies really start as weapons, yeah. as, as toys or as porn. Yeah. Oh, so that's if you look at the development of technologies, uh, printing didn't mm -hmm. take off until the first porn books came out. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I have no, if you think about it, the hormones that drive human motivation, you know, uh, Adder, uh, um, uh, uh, what's it? Uh, <laughs> Adderall, Adderall. I mean, Viagra? Uh, no, but uh, uh, adrenaline, adrenaline drives. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, you know, I wasn't dope, sure. Dope, uh, dopamine drives you. Serotonin yeah. drives you. You know, and um, and so that, uh, you know, if you look at weapons, toys and porn, they're all high hormone activities. Yeah. That really catch people's attention. Yeah. Well, when I when I do any kind of marketing stuff, I always break everything down into my simplifier side says it all comes down to get paid, get laid, live forever. You're promising make more money, um, increase your status, authority, attractiveness um desirability or live forever have a healthy life and then the combo the the holy trinity of products are a better life you know what's the um big promise of strategic coach really it's time freedom it's personal freedom mm -hmm. um and that's a better life but along the way yeah you're going to make more money yeah you're going to increase your status and authority by being the smartest person in the room and having great tools and the longevity, I mean, you think about what your product, um, you know, lifetime, well, you changed the name of it. What do we call a lifetime age expander? Reversal future, age reversal future now. But yeah. you have to have the lifetime extender before you can get to the age reversal future. In okay. other words, you got to change the number of your mind when you're expecting to die to way beyond that. And that gives you uh, a sense of, that you've got a lot of time to explore new things and develop new things. Yeah. You know, I mean, if someone is, a, uh, if someone is 65 and they think they're going to die at 75, they don't do anything new. Yeah. They, so you've got to give they, yourself they, that. They just want to spend, they just want to spend a lot of time at the bar and the departure lounge. Time freedom. Okay. So, so I want to go uh, to the next idea that you shared, which is, 
the dog philosophy and technology yeah. dogs and technology because that'll bring this to the triad that i want to make a point yeah. of which is uh the next evolution of you know because in a way ai is our latest slave you know mm -hmm. the notion of something that never gets tired never complains never goes to bed never needs a vacation um and will do whatever you want to do and doesn't take anything personally it's like do it again do it again try it again try it again and um I, what I noticed with AI in the people who are most effective at it is when you learn how to prompt, stack prompts, pick right fit applications and give it the right commands and also know what it does, what it doesn't do well. Um, once you make a few realizations, you realize that you're not limited necessarily by time, money, capabilities, people, team size. You're really limited by your imagination in your ability to ask great questions. Yeah. And that really is a strong metaphor for and all to collaborate life. and to collaborate. Yes. Oh, for yeah. sure. For sure. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you've talked many times about the earliest known animal collaboration, which is dogs in the relationship with humans. But I think your new observation is thinking about AI as a dog. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because well, I, I have that a, bring us to. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I have uh, my newest quarterly book, uh, which will be my 35th book, small book. These are small books. They're one idea books. And uh, when I was 70, I said, nice goal for me would be in the next 25 years, write 100 small books. Okay. Mm -hmm. I put a whole team together. So I have a certain input to, into it. And the other team members um, do the production and execution and you know, it gets out there. It takes about 50 hours of my time, a quarter to write a new book. And, um, but the name of the book is Owning Technology Like a Great Dog. Uh, Owning Technology Like a Great Dog. And, um, and uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that dogs are a created technology because it was a collaboration between some, you know, kind of, canny wolf and some uh, sort of really smart human being. And mm -hmm. it's, it seems to have happened in a number of different places. So there, there isn't a one spot starting point. Uh, and, uh, but the earliest that they can um, um, detect that dogs, and they do this from bones that they find, skeleton bones they find, but also paintings, uh, that were uh, done on, you know, on cave walls and things like that. All of a sudden, this creature exists, which kind of looks like a wolf, but isn't wild. You know, it seems to be a tame creature. And uh, as near as I can figure, thirty thousand years is where they can prove that dogs were in play, but probably uh, much earlier. But to be scientifically safe, they say it's about thirty thousand. And that's a technology that if you depart from the fact that they're an animal and you uh, think the way that dogs have um, proliferated and then the extraordinarily breeding that produced uh, hundreds of different uh, dogs for specialized human purposes, you know, and uh, and I, I think in the modern age right now that human uh, Americans as a people do more with dogs uh, mm -hmm. than in other places around the world. Dogs are used for incredible number of activities and results. And I think Americans are the ones who um, created companionship as one of the uses of dogs to actually mm -hmm. have dogs as companions. Do dogs, uh, Lee Richter, who uh, you know, as uh, she and her yeah. husband have created an enormous hospital approach, you know, and uh, I always say the best health care system in uh, in Canada, the best health care system in the United States are veterinarian hospitals. And the reason is that they're driven by love where the normal hospital system is driven by fear and greed. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people are fearful of hospitals and because the hospitals, uh, if you want to get sick really fast, almost on schedule, just check yourself into a hospital. There's more right. diseases uh, 
caught in hospitals than they are in the outside world. But anyway, so what I, I did in this book, I just treated dogs as a technology. And the key to mastering the technology of dogs is to be a great owner. Okay. And I said, well, let's, so this is one technology where the solution was to be a great owner. And I said, I think there's a lot we can learn from dogs and owning dogs of what makes a great owner who ends up with great dogs. And I said, let's just apply that to technology. Dogs are a technology. So we say we've got yep. a 30,000 30, year track record of developing this technology. Let's just take the lessons with dogs and apply them to technology. So that's the mm -hmm. basic, basic thesis of the book. And uh, at the end of the book, there's a real punchline because the real key to this is to then only uh, to become full owner of your entire life. The more you're an owner of your own life as a human, the more you'll then attract other individuals into your life, human individuals who are owners of their life. And, you know, the free zone workshop is a good example of that. You know, the people in that room own their lives. They own their time, they own their money, they own their relationships and they own their purpose. And uh, it really resonates with new collaborative opportunities when you know the person that you're dealing with is an owner of their life. And, yep. um, you know, because there, you meet a lot of people who don't own their life, their life owns them, you know, yep. and the circumstances of their life own them, you know, and I think it's binary. You're either an owner or you're owned. There's a whole bunch of ideas that come to mind when you go through that for me, which I find that the more time I spend in a state of pure creativity, innovation, and productivity. research. Productivity. Yes. Yep, for sure. Research for research sake. In other words, I remember a friend of mine once told me one of the highest ROI investments a company can ever make and the signal as to whether or not it's going to survive or not is how much they invest in pure research, um, which at first I thought, ah, oh, that seems idiotic, but like 3M for many years, they have, you know, they give every employee the chance to spend 15% of their time doing pure research. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to even have an, uh, a economic focus because statistically that long-term focus of thinking out 10, 20, 25 years, um, results in some really big innovations. And, um, and, you know, obviously you have to have the right people in that seat where you don't, they don't just go out and uh, go drinking during their 15% of the time, right? They're, they're productive and they, and they love this, the research. So um, the point I guess I'm making is um, when I get to tinker, play, focus on productivity, like you said, but also collaborate. Um, and I've definitely found that the free zone mindset of, let's find ways to create 10 X futures together. Um, is a, is a huge multiplier and you know, and you don't spend your time worrying about how am I going to make this company between us work? If you, if you own yours and I own mine and we're collaborating together to create a brighter 10 X future that we couldn't access by ourselves. And I'd rather invest that time in making valuable stuff than trying to figure out how we're going to split the business and the equity. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of genius there. Hey, this is Mike Koenigs. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but if you're an action taker and ready to transform and reinvent yourself and your business, go to connect to Mike.com to learn more and book a conversation with me right now. All right, back to the episode. Well, That's a lot first of all, you both have to be cash confident. You know, yes. most entrepreneurs are not cash confident. They mm -hmm. always have to be worried about this month's cash flow. And I said, well, just handle that uh, on your own so that when you meet another person and they're cash confident, then you can really think about the future and yep. uh, actually create something new between the two of you that doesn't exist. And yep. uh, it transforms some part of the marketplace it creates a new value proposition in the marketplace mm -hmm. that is um 
uh, that it doesn't exist. And nobody who's a competitor or competitor in your industry would ever possibly think about this because their nose is to the uh, cash flow necessity. They, they have to get the cash. And uh, so you create a third thing that the two of you, neither any competitor in your industry or competitor in the other person's industry would ever think about this because yeah. they don't have the freedom of time. They don't have the freedom of money. They don't have the freedom of relationship to mm -hmm. create, a, create to jointly create a new purpose, you know. And yeah, uh, yeah so it's uh, it's interesting, you know, and you've yeah. created this more or less this free zone center in on the Baja Peninsula, yeah. uh, right on the Pacific. And you just pull people down there and say, OK, you're on free time now, but we'll turn it into thinking time. And let's yeah. just have a couple of days with good hospitality, you know, a lot of sunshine, a lot of exercise. And let's just uh, see what Plenty we of alcohol. Yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, alcohol is a great multiplier. And um, and let's just see if we can come up with something new. And yep. uh, we don't have to worry about the short term money because we've already handled that, you know. Yes. And then most of us have handled the long term money. So that's uh, it's uh, not necessary. But um, um, People who live in scarcity can't even conceive of doing that. Yeah, it's 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 magical, and um, and so um, all of that's true, you know. And and here's what I I'll, again I'll give a lot of credit to you because when I when we first started doing this project, first of all, we had neither Vivian and I had never done real estate before. We we're just scared of it. And I was terrified that I get over leveraged and it's going to be too complicated. And I really didn't want to learn about real estate. I'd, I'd rather focus on what I think I'm great at, but thank God we took a leap and dove into this because now I really understand how it can be such an amazing multiplier. And we just wouldn't have taken these big risks, but here's the credit to you because once I started thinking about, well, let's think about how to make this more of a community and a free zone. Cause at first it was like, Hey, we're going to build a house and our friends are going to build a house. And then it turned into seven homes cause we'd sell them and make some money. And then we thought, and then it was like, well, I'm going to need a studio and a theater and a place to bring people so I can do shows. You know, I got to have an entertainment place. I was like, well, we got to feed people. So we'll throw a restaurant on this thing. And then it's like, shoot, what else do I want? Well, I want more longevity and better health. So uh, let's do a longevity center. And then, you know, I talked to Reagan Archibald. I talked to Brian Sweet, who does money. I talked to another guy who does, uh, Steve Marler does full body scans. And uh, I ended up meeting another guy completely independently. who's a Rutgers professor, but he wants to upgrade his life and teach higher quality people. But we've all been building this uh, wealth longevity um, international is what the collective, the free zone opportunity is between Brian and Reagan and Steve. And um, we bring in other people and that evolved into a much bigger development that required a completely different level of thinking. Um, but when we brought everyone down for a tour and all we have are blank lots, OK, with chalk lines on them and a plan. But four out of four people bought the homes because they loved the vision. And the way I describe it is this is a free zone economy. And um, the United States can be a, a business hostile environment, even though it's one of the least business hostile environments, right? Mm -hmm. Mexico right now is a different type of place to live in. What I've learned after doing business now in Mexico and going through the development effort is um, you don't have to pay anyone off. There's a lot of talk that you got to create, you got to bribe people. And there's all this stuff about you can't own property, which is all nonsense. You, it's easy to own property in Mexico, but you got to educate yourself and you need to invest time in people <clears throat> because in the United States, people will say, well, building codes are building codes and everything follows a certain thing. And, and Mexico is the same way. However, you can get a different answer on a different day, depending on the quality of the relationship you have with a person. Well, <clears throat> right. There's a yeah. different level of flexibility. And I kind of like that. I like being able to make well, a call. You know, what's true, and uh, you'll 
bounce this off your Mexican experience is that nobody's in charge, but rules are in charge. Yeah. And every situation has its own set of rules that uh, have to be followed if you're going to be successful in that situation. Very true. Okay, so I'm going to get to a big idea that I want to uh, kind of play with you on and get your perspective on. Um, because you have a philosophy about technology, which is, um, well, yeah, once you tell it to do the stupid and smart and technology, uh, Dan Sullivanism here. And then I want yeah. to ask you the big question. Well, personally, and this is a personal, you know, this is a personal approach. And then, but when I tell other people about it, uh, they find that they uh, make progress. There's two rules. And the first rule is I always keep smart people between me and the technology. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, my technological skills are uh, just what I need uh, to get my message out. And, uh, you know, um, so, you know, I could type and that was a good skill to have because when yep. computers came in and, you know, and word processing was important. But from that point forward, um, you know, I've created writing tools. I've got tools for different, uh, you know, thinking about projects in a different way. But there was a smart person at Strategic Coach that I would just sketch out what the tool should look like, and he would create all the software for it. So I just get mm -hmm. the benefit. And then, um, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, and then I learned how to use, um, um, we had a, video studio we have an audio studio but other people um created the entire structure they created all the infrastructure for the studio and all mm -hmm. i had to do, I, I i like to write and i like to talk you know and yep. and i try as much as possible not have have too much added that i have to think about than those two two skills well i can think and thinking is good so thinking writing and talking are my three main skills. So I would say that there isn't much of a change in my life since the mid 80s. And mm -hmm. uh, but the um, number of enabling technologies that have come available are really quite extraordinary. OK, but I but I haven't changed. Technology has changed, but I haven't changed. OK, yes. And, and so I have two rules. First rule is to always keep a smart person between me and the technology. And uh, I just had an example of a Gord Vickman, who is managing the call that we're having right now for my side. Yep. I mentioned to him he's going off to the podcast conference in a, you know, in a in a matter of weeks or months. I'm not sure exactly when the date is. And I says, there's one thing I'd like you to look for, for Gord. Um, there's a new technology. I've heard about it, and. Uh, and uh, I talked to him, I think it was yesterday about this. And I said, Gord, when you're down there and it's a technology, you do the Zoom, the Zoom video. And then afterwards, you can insert the background. But it's not like yep. the Zoom background because Zoom background is distorts when you move your, you know, you move your head. I said, this is just looks like a background, like what you have, you know, which is an actual you know, which is actually a physical drawing that you have the, uh, you know, am <clears throat> capability amplifier, but you would be able to do that in post production. And uh, so I just mentioned it to him. He looked it up. He discovered the technology and he's uh, took a look at it. And our production uh, production team and strategic coach is already busy um, getting the handle on it and going forward. Then every podcasts I've done where it was just a room, you know, and but the lighting was good enough that on me, the lighting was good enough, but the background wasn't especially thrilling. And, um, and so within a matter of a couple of weeks, um, so I'm taking advantage of the technology, but I've got smart humans between me and the, you know, and the results. So I don't have to do the result. So yeah. we got two, two who's going here, smart humans is a who, and really more advanced technology is a who, you know, yep. and uh, so I don't do the house. I simply set out a vision of a future result. And then I communicate it to smart people who enjoy, um, you know, 
locate it, sourcing it and mastering it and getting it into play. And um, so, I, uh, you know, and uh, but the other thing is that I use I, rule number two, rule number one is keep a smart human between you and the technology. But the other thing is um, keep technology between you and stupid humans. That can mean a lot of things. I can think of a bunch of applications, but uh, I want to focus on the positive here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> but for example, for example, yeah. uh, uh, it's easy to get to be in contact with me if I want to be in contact with you. Right. So I set up all technological meetings the same way I would set up a physical meeting. Talk to my assistant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have uh -huh. your people talk, have your people call my people. Okay. Yep. I say, well, I just want 10 minutes with Dan. And I say, um, uh, first of all, we have to put it in the schedule. And so you'll send me a fast filter uh, saying what it is that you want to No, it's just 10 minutes. I just want to bounce something off you. And I says, no, I think what you want to do is uh, to delegate your thinking to me so that I do your thinking. And I said, I, I, I don't do that. I, I don't do other people's thinking. I enjoy uh, being in contact with people who do their own thinking. Yes. Because yeah. if we have the meeting and I do your thinking, I'm drained and you just got a freebie. Right. Which is. Um, and my freebie didn't improve you as a thinker. And the other part of that that's great is what Dan likes is conversations, right? Yeah. He wants to feel as though this is my interpretation, Dan Sullivan, but. Um, you are lit up by intriguing, interesting conversations where you walk away learning something and thinking something different and being able to likely create new products and new content um, on top of that, which then you patent, trademark, um, copyright, and they become new thinking tools that multiply, um, <coughs> you know, the members of coach and make you money. You know, it's yep. like uh, you got more uh, more paying fans, which is another important thing. If you want to talk to Dan Sullivan, you got to join coach and you got to learn the tools <clears throat> to learn how to talk to him. So, if, you know, as someone who's just hearing this, they won't even know what the hell a fast filter is. Yeah. So um, it's another tool. It's another technology. Yeah. All right. So you're ready for my big oh, question? And the, and the other oh, yeah, aspect of it, you mentioned that I love having uh, intriguing, interesting conversations mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what I found that only happens uh, when I'm with someone who's an intriguing interesting human being yep which is another filter right it's like if you're <clears throat> gonna invest your energy and be in a uh, relationship with someone they're gonna have to do the work and earn the right to have the conversation and learn your language which I've always said you know being in coach gives you an upgraded operating system identity and you become a better communicator, question asker, and a much deeper thinking. And that is the common language that enables free a free zone economy to exist, which is a it's a it's it's a country with no barriers, borders, uh, religions, politicians, only a f a form of a multiplier capitalism mindset, and. Um, I don't even know if capitalism is the right word for it, but um, um, it's just. Well, it a, is capital. Uh, I have no yeah. problem with capitalism yeah. because capitalism is um, starts with being able to price yourself the way you want for what you're good at, what you're uniquely mm -hmm. good at. I mean, that starts with you. Capitalism is the only system in the world that starts with individual uniqueness. There is no other yeah. system. Starts. Everything. Everybody else talks about collectives. You know. Uh, you know. <clears throat> socialism is about the collective. Fascism is about the collective. Communism yeah. is about the collective. Um, social entrepreneurism is about the collective. Um, <clears throat> I've got a. I've got a rule about the word social. If you have social in front of another word, the word social takes away all the meaning of the second word. Social justice yeah. means there's there's no justice. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Social equality means you, there's no possibility of equality. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, so, so, social improvement means there's no improvement. <laughs>